or alternative budget presentation, as well as a press briefing. Welcome to Palm Valley Resort. Ladies and gentlemen of the media, without further ado, let me, let me ask a member of the National Organizing Committee, no other than Adrian, Adrian Machiava, to give the opening remarks and then to call upon the party president, Patriot for Economic Progress, no other than Comrade Sean Tembo. Comrade Adrian. Thank you. Uh, good uh, morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. At this point, uh, we welcome you to PEP 2024 Alternative uh, National Budget. We remain seated, and uh, for some of us who want to stand, we remain standing as we pay attention to, to, the, uh, to the budget. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen of the media. This morning we are presenting the PEP 2024 Alternative National Budget, which is uh, contained uh, in the briefcase here. Uh, this briefcase has been in existence for the past seven years, from the time we first presented our first alternative budget in uh, 2016. And uh, as you can see, uh, we have remained very resolute in our commitment to continuously present an alternative national budget. <sighs> Countrymen and women, Today's uh, alternative national budget is going to be combined with a media briefing so that we can also attend to other pertinent national issues that are happening across the nation. And so what we've done is to do a summary of the alternative national budget and then in terms of a comprehensive document, it will be shared with you as soon as we finish the presentation here so that you can have the full document. I'm hopeful that you've shared your WhatsApp numbers with the, um, the facilitator so that it can be easy for us to share with you the comprehensive PEP 2024 alternative national budget. The theme for this year's alternative national budget is actually addressing basic needs of the people while pursuing long-term economic goals. And the reason for us choosing this particular theme is because of what is currently happening, where people are not able to have adequate food in their homes, there is a very high cost of living, and we're being told that there are long-term goals being pursued. So that is why the theme of our budget is addressing basic needs of the people while pursuing long-term goals. It is possible, countrymen and women, to address the basic needs of the people even as you pursue long-term goals for the nation. You cannot allow people to be going hungry. You cannot allow people to be um, not able to afford basic needs in the name of pursuing long-term economic needs. The structure of the PEP 2024 alternative budget is basically threefold. The first part consists of a review of economic policies implemented by government over the past year, followed by a review of official national budget, which was presented by the Minister of Finance. And then the last part of our alternative budget is a proposal of economic policies to be implemented in the next fiscal year, which basically makes up the alternative national budget. The alternative national budget for 2024 has specific key elements, which include, number one, the fact that the total proposed expenditure in the alternative budget that we developed as Patriots for Economic Progress 
is 183 billion 412 million 858,561, which represents 32.4 percent of GDP, versus 177 billion 891 million 868,894, which was proposed by government in the official national budget, which represents 31.4 percent of GDP. One of the key themes, the second key theme of the alternative budget is a proposal to terminate all tax holidays given to the mining firms for two specific reasons. Number one, these tax holidays introduced in 2021, immediately after the UPND administration ascended to office, have so far not achieved their intended objective. You must remember that the argument which was given by the Minister of Finance for extending these tax holidays was that it will help increase the production of copper. And according to the minister, production of copper would increase to 3 million metric tons within three years. We are now in the second year, and we've seen that the production of copper has actually dwindled. So clearly, the intended purpose of extending these tax holidays to the mines has not been achieved and is unlikely to be achieved in the foreseeable future. The second reason why we are proposing a termination of all tax holidays extended to the mines is that the nation needs tax revenue, which is being lost by these extended tax holidays. If you look at one of today's newspaper's headlines, which quotes the Bank of Zambia governor, the Bank of Zambia governor is saying that he is not able to intervene in the depreciation of the kwacha because the Bank of Zambia does not have dollars to pump into circulation. And the reason we don't have dollars to pump into circulation to support the depreciation of the kwacha, which is currently standing at 23.6, is because we are not collecting enough money, especially from the mines. And the reason we are not collecting enough money, especially from the mines, is because the UPND administration extended a tax holiday to the mines in 2021. So that is the reason why we are proposing that this tax holiday should be terminated. The third key element of the PEP 2024 alternative national budget is that we propose to increase the tax exempt amount for payers you earn to 10,000 kwacha per person per month so that anyone who gets a gross salary of 10,000 kwacha or below does not pay tax. The basis why we are proposing this amount of 10,000 kwacha is because of the basic foods basket, which is occasionally published by the Jesuit Center for Theological Reflection, which currently stands at about 9,261 kwacha. So that is the amount of money needed for a family to eat, not to pay for accommodation, not to buy clothes, but just to eat. So if a family needs 9,200 kwacha just to eat, then why should you tax people getting 4,000 kwacha? It does not make sense. So that is the basis of our proposal that the tax exempt amount for pay as you earn purposes should be increased to 10,000 kwacha. We move on to some key differences in expenditure between the PEP 2024 alternative national budget and the official GRZ budget. The first key difference between these two budgets is that the PEP 2024 alternative national budget has increased the allocation towards servicing of domestic debt, external debt, and dismantling of domestic arrears by 8.4 billion kwacha, 15.4 billion kwacha, 13.3 billion kwacha, respectively. And you note that uh, the reason we decided to increase the allocation towards amortizing these debts is because when you look at domestic debt, domestic debt is basically debt which is made up of the treasury bills, 
that the Bank of Zambia issues on behalf of government from time to time, as well as government bonds. Now, the problem, the biggest problem of domestic borrowing is that it essentially wipes out the liquidity in the market because government borrows all their available money in circulation such that if you and I wants to go to the bank to go and borrow to start a business, the bank will be unwilling to lend you money because they would rather buy government bonds or buy treasury bills because they know the government cannot default, whereas you or Sean Tembo can default. So domestic debt has the overall effect of crowding out private sector borrowing. And without private sector financing, you can kiss goodbye to growing the economy. Because the private sector needs to be able to borrow and be able to expand or start new operations. So that is the basis for us increasing the amount allocated in the alternative budget towards liquidating the domestic debt, which, by the way, is currently standing at $214 billion. 214 billion kwacha is how much government has borrowed from the banks. So there's very little money left for a business person to go and borrow from the banks. When you look at the issue of domestic arrears, domestic arrears is basically the money which government owes to various suppliers of goods and services. So it is slightly different from domestic debt. When you look at domestic arrears, domestic arrears are currently standing at about uh, 60 billion kwacha. And that essentially means that people who supplied goods to government, people who supplied mini-meal to schools, people who supplied various goods and services to government have not been paid. And the total amount that government owes to these suppliers is about 60 billion kwacha. Now, the overall effect that that has on the economy is that there is no liquidity in the economy because the people who supply government are people like you and I. When you win a contract to supply stationery to government, you go and borrow somewhere, you make that order, you supply government, and then government takes three years, four years, five years, eight years to pay you. First of all, where you have borrowed, the people who have uh, sold your collateral whatever collateral you have given. So it has the overall effect of destroying the economy. And we have a situation whereby the New Dawn administration used to talk about the issue of domestic arrears when they were in the opposition, but they took over office in 2021 when domestic arrears were standing at 22 billion kwacha. And as we speak right now, domestic arrears are standing at more than 60 billion kwacha. So clearly, you can see that they were talking about domestic arrears but the moment they went into office, they forgot what they were talking about. We then move on to some key differences in revenue sources between the PEP 2024 alternative national budget and the official GRZ budget. So some of the key differences um, are that, number one, the PEP 2024 alternative national budget proposes to increase the amount of domestic revenue from 141.1 billion, which is in the official national budget, to 183.4 billion in the alternative budget. And how we are going to achieve that is by, among other things, terminating the tax holidays given to the mines, so that government can be able to collect all the revenue that is due to it. This increment is made up of a proposed increase in tax revenue from 114.6 billion in the official budget to 129.4 billion in the alternative national budget, as well as an increase in non-tax revenue from 26.5 billion kwacha in the official budget to 54.1 billion kwacha in the PEP alternative national budget. This increase, of course, uh, will result in an increase in the tax revenue to GDP ratio, which has averaged about 17.6% in the past 10 years or so to about 23% if the alternative budget was to be implemented. Some of the macroeconomic objectives in the alternative national budget include, number one, ensuring that any adjustments 
in the statutory reserve ratio and the monetary policy rates are not more than 100 basis points at any given time. And B, ensuring that any adjustment to the price of fuel products does not exceed 5% at any given time. Now, you might ask the reason for that. If you saw a memo which was issued by the Bank of Zambia, is it yesterday or the other day, where they increased the statutory reserve ratio, they actually increased the statutory reserve ratio by about 2%, which is about 200 basis points. And when you increase key economic parameters by that big margin, it actually has the overall effect of having a shock to the economy. So whenever you're making these adjustments, it is very critical that you make very small adjustments so that they don't have a shock effect on the economy. So, ladies and gentlemen, that basically represents a summary of the alternative budgets in terms of the key highlights. And uh, like we indicated earlier, we are going to share the detailed document with you. Those who have attended our alternative national budgets in the past remember that the presentation of the budget when we read it word by word would normally take about two hours. So we decided that we are going to present a summary of the alternative national budget and share with you the comprehensive document so that um, uh, you can further uh, review the proposed alternative national budget. We now proceed to the second part of our program, which is the media briefing. Our media briefing is essentially made up of about four key items. And the first item is the issue of the breakdown in the law of law. When you talk about the breakdown in the law of law, there are various aspects which make that up. And uh, the most dominating, perhaps, is the abuse of state institutions to break the law with impunity. When we talk about abuse of state institutions, we are talking about an example of the Speaker of the National Assembly violating the Constitution of the Republic and implementing changes in terms of the leader of opposition when the Constitution clearly guides on how the leader of opposition is to be uh, elected in Parliament, which is by voting among uh, the opposition members of Parliament. And the excuse given by the Speaker is that based on precedence, there was no vote. It could have been precedence because no one contested it. But the moment someone contests the issue, then you need to follow what is written in the law. Like the Constitution states very clearly, the Constitution is supreme. It reigns supreme over any subsidiary registration. It reigns supreme over any practices. It reigns supreme over any precedence. So it doesn't matter what the precedence is. The bottom line is that the Constitution of the Republic of Zambia is more supreme than any precedence that the speaker is trying to argue about. And from our standpoint, that is a clear violation of the Constitution, and that represents a total breakdown in the law of law. Another example is the case of the Registrar of Societies who was harassed and transferred on the basis that she complied with the court order, with a subpoena to avail a list of office holders for uh, the opposition patriotic front party. That, again, is a clear case of violation of the rule of law and abuse of state institutions by the UPND administration in their governance of the nation. A third example, countrymen and women, of abuse of state institutions is the Zambia Police Service taking sides in the internal conflict of the PF party, where the Zambia Police Service went and camped at the PF secretariat and stopped one group of uh, 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 PF members from accessing the secretariat while allowing another group. In a properly functioning democracy, what was supposed to happen there is that the two conflicting groups 
in the patriotic front were supposed to go to court, as they have done. And they were both supposed to wait for a ruling of the court in terms of who should continue to reside in the secretariat while the main matter is being heard. Only after the court rules would the police now camp at the secretariat and enforce the ruling or the order of the court. But we saw the Zambia Police Service camping at the Secretariat for the Patriotic Front without any order from the court, just based on the appetite of the government to support one faction of the opposition Patriotic Front over another faction. That consists of abuse of state institutions. The second aspect which represents the breakdown in the law of law is the heavy-handedness, the torture, and murder by the Zambia police and other defense wings involved in law enforcement, such as the Zambia National Service and the Zambia Army. And at this point, countrymen and women, I would like to request all of you to stand up and observe a minute of silence for Crispin Bunda, who was murdered by the Zambia National Service two days ago in Mfurira in cold blood. Can we please observe a moment of silence? Thank you. Thank you so much. Countrymen and women, I'm sure the majority of you actually saw for yourselves the video of how Crispin Bunda was actually murdered in Mfurira. The Zambia National Service fired at small children. Those were small children. What kind of a country do we have where the defense wings can actually have the audacity to fire on unarmed citizens. There was only one shot fired there, and that shot killed the young boy, the 15-year-old boy. There was no warning shot fired in the air, no uh, rubber bullets fired anywhere, just one shot aimed at an innocent soul. And yet, when you hear what government officials are saying, uh, those who monitored what the Copper Belt minister said, they are all talking about, no, we'll buy Miri Mew, uh, for the funeral, we'll do this, we'll do that. None of the government officials are actually talking about identifying that particular soldier and making sure he is arrested and charged with murder. None of the government officials. The question is, is that the Zambia that we are going to live in, where life has got no value, where people are being slaughtered in the roads like dogs, is that the Zambia that we are going to live in? Is that the Zambia that the citizens of this country voted for on the 12th of August 2021, where innocent citizens are being butchered? Countrymen and women, again, you forgive me, but I'll humbly request you to stand up again and observe a minute of silence for Alan Skaonga, who was beaten to death in police custody at Mukushi Central Police Station again about two days ago. Thank you. Thank you so much. Countrymen and women, based on the information that we were able to get from media reports, Mr. Alan Skaonga was taken to the police station at Mkushi Central Police on accusations that he had stolen 1,300 kwacha, together with another man who we understand was subsequently admitted to hospital. And these people were beaten and then beaten and then beaten again until Mr. Alan Skaonga died in police custody. 
Again, I ask, is that the Zambia that the citizens of this republic voted for on the 12th of August 2021? So far, again, when you listen to the comments on this issue from government officials, from the Zambia Police Service itself, everyone is talking about we shall investigate. We shall investigate. And I'm very confident that again this issue will die a natural death without the culprits being brought to book. In a properly functioning democracy where the rule of law is respected, the people who beat Mr. Alan Skaonga to death in police custody, those police officers were supposed to be arrested immediately and charged with murder. That is how a country with properly functioning rule of law operates. But that is not the case. Again, countrymen and women, we have the case of Maria Chimona of Korwe Village, Chief Chiwara in Masaiti District, who was shot by Zambia Army soldiers about two days ago again and is currently battling for her life at Ndora Teaching Hospital. Another innocent soul shot by the defense wings for no good reason. Again, I ask the same question. Is this the Zambia that the citizens of this republic voted for on the 12th of August 2021? When the people woke up at 04 hours in the morning and went to cast their votes, is this what they expected? Is this what they voted for? And my answer to that question is a definite no. Again, countrymen and women, we have the case of Mr. Kelvin Mwape, who is a young, young man, about 13 years of age, who was gunned down by Zambia National Service soldiers in Kashiva village of Ruapula, in the Ruapula province of Zambia but luckily survived and is currently handicapped for life. Again, I ask the same question I've been asking this morning. When the citizens of this republic woke up early in the morning, on the morning of 12th of August 2021, and went to vote for the UPND administration, and went to vote for Hakainde Hichirema, is this the Zambia that they wanted? Is this the Zambia that they voted for? And again, I answer my own question. No, this is not the Zambia that the people of this nation expected when they voted for the United Party for National Development. Again, countrymen and women, we have the case, the cases rather, of Lazwan Dawood Patel, Ambassador Emmanuel Mwamba, and myself, who have been tortured by the Zambia police while in custody. All this represents a total breakdown in the rule of law. And it is our submission that President Hakainde Ichirema has failed to preside over the affairs of this country. President Hakainde Ichirema has failed to govern this country. This country has become ungovernable. Anyone who has a gun and a uniform can kill any Zambian and they'll do it without repercussions. Any ZNS officer can walk in here as we are seated here and kill one or two of us and that officer will go away without repercussions just like the young man, just like the young man, Crispin Bunda, was murdered like a dog in Mfurira two days ago. Just like the young man, Kelvin Mwapi, was gunned down by ZNS officers a few months ago. Any officer, any defense wing soldier can walk in here and kill a citizen without repercussions. That is the Zambia we are in. That is the new dawn, countrymen and women. The new dawn. It also follows that police officers can walk in here and apprehend any one of us here, take them into custody, and beat them to death. 
and those officers will not face any repercussions. That is the new dawn that the people of this nation voted for on the 12th of August. Just like Mr. Alan Sikaonga was apprehended, taken into custody, and beaten to death over an allegation that he had stolen 1,300 kwacha. That is the new dawn that we now live in, countrymen and women. Countrymen and women, I move on to the issue of abuse of legal processes by the UPND administration. And in that regard, there are three key items that I wish to highlight. The first item is the issue of arresting people on flimsy grounds and on cases that cannot stand in court for the sole purpose of trying to find another case in the process of the arrest. So they'll come to you, they know they don't have any case against you, they'll come to you, arrest you, put you into custody in the hope that during the arrest or during your stay in custody, they'll find something else that they can arrest you on and charge you on and take you to court on. Examples of this nature include Mr. Amos Chanda, who was arrested for uh, fraud and related cases, but those cases were never taken to court because they were frivolous cases. Instead, what was taken to court is a charge of use of insulting language on SEC officers. So they come to you, arrest you, and then lock you up, release you on bond, and never take that case to court because it's a frivolous case. But they hope that as they are harassing you, you say something which they can then say, ah, he did this, and then arrest you on the second issue, and that's the issue that they now take to court. Another example is that of uh, um, Ambassador Emmanuel uh, Mwamba, who was arrested on various charges, including um, uh, leaking whatever confidential information and things like that, and all those frivolous cases were not taken to court. Instead, what the police took to court is an allegation that Mr. Mwamba assaulted one of them when he was being apprehended. And yet, when you look at the pictures, it is Ambassador Emmanuel Mwamba who was actually assaulted. The actual case which they had arrested Ambassador Emmanuel Mwamba on has never been taken to court because it was a frivolous case. And even when they were arresting him, they knew it's a frivolous case, but they used it as a fishing hook so that they can look for other things as they are arresting him. Another example <clears throat> is that of my brother, uh, Mr. Chirufia Tayari, who we understand is now on the other side, uh, but we, res we respect his, uh, uh, his choices, where he was arrested on some funny charge, but that charge was never taken to court. Instead, they said he assaulted a female police officer while in custody, and that's the charge that they then took to court. You see a pattern there. There's a very clear pattern. And so far, when you look at the flimsy cases they've been arresting me on, you realize that all the cases have not been taken to court because they are very flimsy cases, because no one, no one, and nowhere in any law does it say that President Hakainde Ichirema is officially Bari, or is officially Mambara, or is officially any other name. Nowhere. So they arrest you and say you are using hate language against the president when you were referring to Mambara, and then they fail to take that case to court because the court is going to laugh at them when they try to convince the court that actually Mambara is the equivalent of President Haka in the Ichirem, or Bari is the equivalent of Haka in the Ichirem. That would be a laughable case. So they keep arresting you, and they arrest you be sure that you are in custody for a prolonged period, prolonged period, six days, seven days, you are in custody. And then they give you bond, you go to court, they are not at court. 
Because if you accuse me of using hate speech against President Agarinda Ichirema, then let's meet in court. Let's meet in court. Don't arrest me and end there by punishing me extrajudicially. Let us meet in court. You present your evidence in court, and I'll challenge you in court. And when I'm acquitted, I'm going to sue you as well. So you see a pattern there. And what I can tell you, countrymen and women, when you look at these two, three examples I've given you, that of Mr. Amos Chanda, that of Mr. Chirufiatayari, and that of Ambassador Emmanuel Mamba, I can assure you that it's just a matter of time before they use one of the arrests they make on me to find something else which they can then also arrest me on and take me to court for. Because clearly the cases, the frivolous cases that they arrest me on are too frivolous to be taken to court. So that, countrymen and women, represents a total abuse of judicial processes, a total abuse and a total breakdown of the rule of law. And again, I ask the same question I've been asking this morning. Is that the new Dawn administration, which the people of Zambia woke up early in the morning on 12th of August to vote for? If the people of Zambia knew that President Hakainde Ichirema would turn out to be this monster that he now is, would they have elected him president? And again, countrymen and women, allow me to answer my own question. The answer is a definite no. The answer is a definite no. A second example of abuse of legal processes by the UPND administration is forfeiting people's property without giving the owners of the property a chance to be heard. You forfeit someone's property and you don't give that person a chance to be heard. A case in point is that of Honorable Tasira Lungu Mwansa. And the latest ruling of the Economic and Financial Crimes Court, which ruled that Honorable Tasira Lungu Mwansa does not need to be heard in the issue of the non-conviction uh, based for forfeiture that is being driven by the DPP. This is the owner of the property. And the court is saying that the owner of the property does not need to be heard in the forfeiture of her property. And the argument of the court is that the issue is about the property and not the owner. Did that property just come about? Uh, did it drop from heaven? It, uh, it makes no sense. And again, it comes down to the issue we have always argued about, that the Economic and Financial Crimes Court was created for the sole purpose of pursuing a witch hunt against opposition leaders, those who oppose President Haka in the Ichirema. That is what the Economic and Financial Crimes Court was created for, both at major streets level and at high court level. Because we've seen the quality of its decisions. They are very poor rulings and the judgments that come from this court. Almost all of them on appeal, they are thrown out. An example is the issue of the immunity agreement that was entered into between SEC and Honorable Shitotera, which the Economic and Financial Crimes Court upheld at high court level, and upon appeal to the Court of Appeal, it was thrown out. So it shows to show that this newly created court was created as a personal court, as a personal to hold a court of President Hakainde Ichirema for the sole purpose of using it against his political opponents. And we say abash to those machinations, abash to the abuse of the rule of law. That is totally unacceptable and the people of Zambia should say no to that. A third example, countrymen and women, of abuse of legal processes by the UPND administration is the frivolous consent judgments entered into between the Attorney General and various UPND members, which has had the overall effect of defrauding the nation of millions of kwacha. Every Jim and Jack who wore a UPND regalia 
when UPND was in, office, was in opposition, can now go to the office of the AG and file a lawsuit in court, and the AG, within hours, will quickly enter into a concert judgment with that uh, particular UPND cadre. Within hours, countrymen and women. Hours. They enter into a concert judgment. And within days, they receive a payment. And when we say a payment, we are not talking about small money. We are talking about millions. That recent group of cadres were each paid five million each for spending a few days in police cells. What about us who spend weeks on frivolous charges? Why are we not being compensated? So clearly, you can see that these consent judgments are criminal in nature. They are criminal in nature and they consist of theft of public funds. And it's just a matter of time, I can assure you, countrymen and women, that it's a matter of time, there will come a time when the Attorney General will be held accountable for this theft of funds through these so-called consent judgments. There will come a time. Time and chance favors all. There will come a time when he shall be held accountable. Countrymen and women, <clears throat> the fourth item under the breakdown in the law of law is the issue of government's contempt for anyone with opposing views. Anyone with opposing views. So if there is anyone out there, whether you are civil society, whether you are an ambassador attached to Zambia, whether you are a political party or a church organization, and you want to say anything which is not place singing to the UPND government, then just be ready to be insulted by UPND members, by government officials, and by other people. The first case in point, countrymen and women, <clears throat> is the arrest of Mr. Charwe Kaume, a Kaume-based radio caller who complained about the harsh economy. I'm sure you all remember, being people in the media, you all heard the audio by yourselves. The man was asked, how are you? He said, no, I'm well, except uh, that uh, there is hunger at home. So when we eat supper, we need to make sure we leave something which we can eat in the morning. Because you people did not fulfill your promises. And for sure, they didn't fulfill their promises. Mr. Charwe Kaume did not insult the permanent secretary for Central Province. He did not. On the other hand, it is the permanent secretary for Central Province who insulted Mr. Charwe Kaume. And despite being insulted, despite being insulted, Mr. Charwe Kaume maintained his decency in his conversation with the permanent secretary. He did not insult the permanent secretary back. He did not. We all listened to the audio. And yet, what do we see? We see police apprehending Mr. Charwe Kaume. The question is, why? Why did the police apprehend Mr. Charwe Kaume? The Kaume-based radio caller. There is no justifiable reason other than abuse of the power that we gave President Hakainde Ichirema on the 12th of August. Instead of President Hakainde Ichirema using that power to improve the lives of the people of this country, to reduce the cost of living, to reduce the cost of minimum, he is using that power to harass Sean Tembo, he is using that power to harass Charwe Kaume, he is using that power to harass Dr. Fred Membe, he is using that power to harass uh, Honorable Given Ruvinda, he is using that power to harass Honorable uh, Bowman Rusambo, and anyone who has a dissenting voice. My question again is, is that what the people of Zambia voted President Hakainde Ichirema into office for? Countrymen and women, in that conversation between the Permanent Secretary for Central Province, Mr. Muna uh, Manakampwe, and uh, Mr. Charwe Kaume. In that conversation, when you listen to that conversation, if anybody is supposed to be arrested among those two people, it is the permanent secretary and not Mr. Charwe Kaume. But that is the Zambia we are living in. Number two, <clears throat> insults directed 
at the Catholic Church by the UPND Secretary General, Mr. Batuke Imenda, who referred to the Archbishop of Lusaka as a Lucifer for the mere offense of the Archbishop giving counsel to government on that issue which first started from uh, the priest is it in Chawama, where government said he should be taken to school. So you can see the intolerance there. When you look at where that issue started from, that uh, uh, priest was merely saying, whatever graphs you are preparing, can you please ensure that as you are doing those long-term goals, you also provide the basic needs of the people. Not a graph. That is what that priest said. That countrymen and women is feedback because that priest on a day, on a, on a weekly basis, he interacts with the people of that compound. And he gets the complaints of hunger from the people of that compound. So when the priest has an opportunity to disseminate some counsel to government, he, he is supposed to utilize that opportunity and give counsel to government. But when you look at the response of the government, and when we say government, we are not talking about a junior official of the government. We are talking about President Hakainde Hichirema himself. He answered with a lot of contempt. He said the priest should go back to school. When you look at the academic qualifications of that priest, you realize that he's a very learned man. So is that the way you are supposed to respond to people who give you advice when you are president? When you are president, you are president of all the citizens of this country. Some of the citizens are suffering, they will complain. Others are doing well, they will praise you. But when those who are suffering complain, you are not supposed to insult them. You are supposed to listen to their cries. That is what a responsible president does. And it is very evident that Mr. Hakainde Hichilema is very far from being a responsible president. A president who is supposed to listen to the cries of the citizens when the citizens cry. So you can see a pattern there, countrymen and women. Because of that intolerance shown by the president towards that priest, everybody else under him developed that same intolerance, including the permanent secretary for central province, Mr. Milner Manakamp. You might ask, where does he get that intolerance? Of course, he gets it from his boss, the president, because the president insulted the priest who explained that the people are hungry. And as you do those graphs explaining about economic growth, can you please ensure that Mirimi is affordable? Because people need to eat so that they can pay attention to your graphs. Can you look at the graph when you are hungry? You can't. You need to have food in the stomach, then you can pay attention to the graph where the president is explaining about economic growth and ABCD that he plans to achieve. So, countrymen and women, the third example of uh, uh, the intolerance of government to those who have dissenting views is a case where insults were recently directed at civil society leaders, including Lola Miti, Linda Kasonde, and others, by UPND senior members, mainly for condemning the Zambia police service habit of prolonged detentions without bond or bail for easily bondable offenses. And talking about Lola Michi, uh, you need to go and uh, explain to her that she needs to be consistent because today she's supporting the bad actions of government, tomorrow she's condemning those actions, so it gets us confused. So she needs to adopt a firm stance in terms of the performance of the new Don administration. Is she against their abuse of the rule of law or is she in support so that we know clearly? A fourth example, countrymen and women, of um, the intolerance of the UPND administration is the insults that were recently directed at the Law Association of Zambia and its president, uh, Mr. Lungisani Lungu, for giving his position on the controversy of the speaker changing leader of the opposition in parliament without complying with the constitutional requirements by the chief government spokesperson, uh, Honorable Cornelius Mwetwa. So we see that um,
from time and again, it has been the mandate of the Law Association of Zambia to comment on legal matters that are being faced by this country. Whatever legal controversies, it is a custom that the Law Association of Zambia would comment. And when Mr. Uh, Lungu, Mr. Rungsan Lungu, the last president, commented on the issue of the speaker changing leader of a position in parliament without complying with the requirements of the constitution, he was merely discharging the mandate of the Law Association of Zambia. He did not go outside the mandate of the association. So there was no need whatsoever for um, Mr. Cornelius Mwitwa to go on an attack of the last president other than for the purpose of showing intolerance to anybody who has dissenting voices, anybody who is not a praise singer. And again, countrymen and women, I ask the same question that I've been asking since morning. When you look at the performance of the New Dawn administration, you look at their intolerance, their abuse of the rule of law, their appetite to demean and insult those who have opposing voices, is that the Zambia that the people of this country voted for on the 12th of August 2021? Is that the Zambia that they envisaged when they voted for Mr. Hakainde Hichirema to be president on that particular day? And the answer to that is a definite no. So allow me to take this opportunity to offer counsel to Mr. Hakainde Hichirema, the president of the Republic of Zambia. Mr. President, that position which you are in today, you are the seventh person to occupy that position. That position can be a sweet, sweet position, but it can also land you into problems if you do not comply with the provisions of the law. The law is very clear. It guides you what you are supposed to do. When the law says you need to be held accountable, be accountable. And when you talk about accountability, you don't need anyone to force you to be accountable. You don't need a court order to compel you to be accountable. Be accountable on your own for your own posterity. If it means declaration of assets, do it voluntarily. Even if there is no law, even if some of us went to the constitutional court and we lost the case, do it voluntarily. You declare your assets because it is for your own good. It is for your own posterity. And you may wish to note that the position of president of the republic is a very complicated position for the simple reason that unlike these other positions, unlike a position of minister or unlike a position of permanent secretary, you find that the president is really not answerable to anybody. When you look at our governance systems here in Zambia, the president is only answerable to himself. So it is up to the president himself to exercise self-restraint and not do certain things. There is no one who is going to compel the president not to do certain things. Not his advisors, not his ministers, not his permanent secretaries. Nobody is going to compel the president not to do certain things or to do certain things. So if President Hakainde Ichirema does something which his conscience tells him that it is wrong, but he proceeds to do it, he should remember, you should remember, Mr. President, that you are not doing yourself a service. You are not doing yourself a service. You are not doing yourself a service. When your conscience tells you that what you are doing is wrong, stop it immediately because no one else is going to stop you. When you issue your instruction, your instruction will be implemented because you are the president. So it is entirely up to you to control yourself, to have self-restraint, to avoid abusing your position, to avoid uh, harassing your opponents, to avoid uh, treating others who are less powerful than you in an unfair manner. Because regardless of how powerful we may be today, there will come a day when we are less powerful. And someone else will be more powerful. And the question that you should always ask yourself is, 
when you find yourself in a situation where you are less powerful and someone else is more powerful than you, how would you like to be treated? Would you like to be treated in an unfair manner? And the answer is a definite no. So instead of harassing one another, instead of persecuting those who are less powerful than you, instead of treating others unfairly by getting away their property without them being heard, instead of allowing your people to beat up their opponents the way the Ndola mayor was beaten during the Zambia versus um, Congo Brazzaville game at Levi Manawasa in full view of police officers and yet no one has been arrested. Instead of allowing those abuses of power, ensure that you exercise your power in a manner that benefits the citizens because your time is limited just like the time of any president is limited. Your time is limited. You might, you might have the best laid plans and figure out that, no, when I leave, I'll put this one and this one will protect me. But we all know that even the best laid plans don't always come out the way they expect them to come out. When President, when former and late President uh, Chirova appointed uh, former and late President Manawasa to be uh, his predecessor, he did not expect in the wildest of dreams that President Manawasa is the one who would start parading him at court. He did not. So the best thing is to do the right thing at any given time, to avoid abusing the power that the people gave to you and to use that power to improve the lives of the people. The people are hungry and soon, very soon, the people will become angry with you. Thank you. We shall now... Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, members of the press. We can take the questions now. Those of us who have questions, you can fire your questions. Uh, President Sean Tembo will answer them. We'll come to the part where you are free to ask any questions. You can ask your questions on the budget. You can ask your questions on the press briefing that is just given. And uh, give us your name and the media house you're representing, and then you fire your question. Yes, please. Uh, good. Oh, good morning, Mr. President. Uh, good morning. Uh, just wanted your name from Crown TV. Uh, Mr. President, when it comes to uh, the press briefing, allow me to touch on uh, an issue that has been in public domain, and this has to do with uh, a list that was uh, uh, purportedly leaked uh, but it has to do with uh, some recommendations of the UPND to increase the presidential term, to change the constitution, the 50 plus 1 issues are also there. But I just want to find out on the presidential term, if there was such a recommendation that was made that the UPND intends to increase the presidential term from 5 years to 7 years, what would be your response to the president? Thank you. We have another question, so it means we can combine them. I think we can answer one question at a time and then go to the next one. Thank you very much, Mr. Joshua from Crown TV. We have come across that list of uh, proposed amendments to the Constitution, and uh, our immediate reaction is that we are totally, completely opposed to each and every proposed amendment to the Constitution because we see each of those amendments as retrogressive and as a big, serious backward step in terms of the governance and the democracy of this country. Answering your specific question on the issue of the seven years, you know, when you talk about the mandate given to the president, five years is a very, very long time for anyone to formulate and implement their policies. Why should someone be given seven years? When you look at the UPND administration, for instance, within a period of two years, you realize that most of the people that actually voted for them, if they were asked today to say, can you vote for the UPND, their answer is a definite no. So when a government misperforms, underperforms, and uh, they, they've become unpopular, 
Why should you continue imposing that government on the people for a prolonged period of seven days? It makes no sense whatsoever. So we are particularly opposed to that. But also, I'll, if you allow me, I will dwell on the other uh, issues in the recommendations that were leaked. Uh, the issue of removing the requirement for the learning net, where <clears throat> the president, we go back to the old system where the president actually appoints the vice president. Again, that is very retrogressive because when the vice president is an elected official, it means that they have security of tenure. They can discharge their mandate in accordance to the rule of law without having to implement things that they are not comfortable with or that are illegal as instructed by the president. But when you are an appointee, you don't have a firm standing of your own and you become a puppet of the, of the president at a given time. And so if we were to move back from having a running mate to appointing a vice president, we would be taking a lot of steps backwards in our dispensation of a constitutional democracy as a republic. When you also look at the issue of um, uh, the 50 plus 1 clause and saying that we need to go back to a simple majority, a president decides a lot of things about the people in a given country. A president decides on your welfare. A president formulates the policies which are implemented and affect each and every citizen. So does it make sense that a person who is that powerful should be voted into office by a small fraction of the people of the country? It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. It's only fair that a president should be voted into office by more than half of the citizens of this country. And that is the case in all, you know, uh, uh, democracies, progressive democracies across the world. Whether you look at America, you look at uh, the UK, anywhere you look at, a president has to be voted into office by at least more than half of the citizens or the electoral college, whatever the case might be. So again, that proposal in the proposed amendment by the UPND to amend the constitution is very retrogressive and we completely and totally oppose it. And when they begin that process, we shall not be shy to go and protest on the roads. We shall not be shy to go and demonstrate. And we shall not be shy to tell other citizens of this republic to go and protest. Just to be sure and just to be clear, uh, because we know that Ambassador Emmanuel Mwamba was recently arrested for calling for protests. There is nothing illegal about protesting. The right to protest the right to assemble is guaranteed in the Bill of Rights in the Constitution of Zambia, unless you are going to riot. The difference between a riot and a protest is that a riot is peaceful, or rather a riot is not peaceful and a protest is peaceful. A protest, you comply with the law, and you are protesting, you are carrying crackers, you are protesting. If you are rioting, you are breaking windows and breaking cars. That is rioting. So no one said we are going to riot. Just like Ambassador Emmanuel Mamba did not say he's going to call for mass riots. He didn't. He said he's going to call for mass mobilization and mass protests. And even ourselves, should the UPND proceed with taking these proposed amendments of, uh, to the Constitution to Parliament, we are also going to call for mass protests. We are going to call for mass protests. Okay. We can take the next question. Thank you. Any other question? Yes, comment. Yes. Uh, good morning, Mr. President. Good morning, uh, Mr. Chan. My name is Darius. Yes, indeed. Um, mine is, um, we've seen quite a number of uh, comments from um, opposition leaders uh, which you have touched on. cost of giving to, but the argument from the ruling party, the UPN, has been there's no strong opposition to move them uh, from office, and um, the Secretary General of the party, the Secretary General, has been quoted saying that 
UPND has been waiting for 19 years. <coughs> With that said, and this is happening. <coughs> Thank you. <clears throat> On the narrative that there is no strong opposition in Zambia at the moment, I want to remind you that in 1991, 1991, the UNIP government thought that there was no strong opposition in Zambia. Where is the UNIP government today? In 2011, the PF administration thought there was no strong opposition in Zambia. Where is the PF today? Right now, the UPND think there is no strong opposition in Zambia. And come 2026, I want to advise President Hakain de Ichirema to make good friends with the former president, George Ware, so that they can begin to rehearse on the acceptance speech for losing an election. Because given on what is on the ground at the moment, and should the trend continue, given on the high cost of living, it is very, very unlikely that the UPND can bounce back in 2026, despite their access to government resources. You must remember, countrymen and women, that when UNIP lost elections in 1991, they had access to government resources. When the Patriotic Front lost power in 20, or rather the MMD lost power in 2011, they had access to government resources. When the Patriotic Front lost power in 2021, they had access to government resources. So access to government resources can make people become pompous but it's not a guarantee that they can be re-elected, especially in a general election. Especially in a general election. The abuse of government resources can work in a by-election, but it definitely is very difficult for it to work in a general election. And the biggest opposition in Zambia is not any political party. When the MMD won elections in 1991, they were only a few months old. So the biggest opposition in Zambia is the people of Zambia. So my advice to the UPND is that instead of them saying that there is no strong opposition political party in Zambia, they should be saying the people of Zambia are happy with our performance. Because it is not the political party that determines whether you stay in office or not. It is the people of Zambia, each of whom vote. Those are the people who decide whether you're going to remain in office as a government or not. So the UPND should change their argument from saying that there is no strong opposition to saying that the people are happy, of which the people are not. Yes. Coming to your second question, do we see the possibility of uniting as opposition for purposes of 2026. Yes, we see that possibility. We see that possibility. Is it likely to happen? Well, it remains to be seen. But I must mention that I'm not very optimistic about it for a number of reasons. Of course, when you begin to unite, so based on our experience, as you rightly indicated, when you We've previously been in these alliances. So when you begin to unite, there are a number of factors that actually push you apart. One of which is uh, the intervention of uh, government operatives who begin to approach some of your members, some of the political parties in the alliance, and making them to turn against other members. Before you realize it, you are suing each other in the courts, and there's pandemonium, and there's confusion. So... That is one of the reasons why it is usually very difficult to unite. Another reason is uh, just the egos of us political leaders. Us political leaders, especially here in Zambia, we seem to have very big egos, despite the sizes of our political parties. Each one wants to become a president. 
Each one wants to lead the others. Each one wants to be the one on top. So that again tends to have the effect of disuniting political parties. But in an ideal situation, it would be very nice if we were united. But speaking for ourselves as patriots for economic progress, whether we have an alliance or we don't have an alliance, we are very, very hopeful and confident that come 2026, our performance is going to be far, 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 far better than it has ever been. We'll take the next question. Any other question? Wow. Well, this we don't if we still not have any other question. If that is the case, I invite back President Tembo to give his closing remarks. And then he will say a prayer and call it a day. Countrymen and women, it is always a pleasure to present the alternative national budget. I call it a pleasure because many people have asked the question to say, what is the job of an opposition political party? We've seen that the Constitution acknowledges the existence of opposition political parties in this country. But there's nowhere where the functions and duties of an opposition political party are defined. Nowhere whatsoever. But for us, we decided to define our own duties. What are our duties as patriots for economic progress in the dispensation of the governance of this country? And we came up with two specific duties. We told ourselves that our first duty is to provide checks and balances to the government of the day. And when I say checks and balances, I mean we need to monitor the government of the day in terms of the decisions they make. Are those decisions in favor of the Zambian people or those decisions are in favor of the pockets of the government officials? We need to monitor how the resources of the country are being used. When tax holidays are given to a certain mining house, are they being given genuinely or someone is getting a transfer of a few million dollars in their offshore account somewhere? That is our job, to offer checks and balances at any given time. That is our number one duty. And most people only know the first duty of an opposition political party, to say your job is to provide checks and balances. However, for us, we told ourselves that there is another second core duty that an opposition political party has in a democracy like ours. And that is it to provide alternative solutions to the problems facing the nation. At any given time, there are a number of problems that are facing the nation. And you as opposition, your job is not only to condemn and attach blame to those who are learning the affairs of the nation. No. You can do that, but that is only half of the job. The other half of the job is to provide alternative solutions. If you were put in office, what would you do? In terms of specific items, when you talk about the mining sector, if it was you running the affairs of this country, how would you handle the issue of KCM and Mopani? You talk about agriculture, if it was you running the affairs of Zambia, if you, Mr. Sean Tembo, you were the president of the Republic of Zambia, how would you learn the agriculture sector? How would you ensure that you strike a balance between the cost of producing agriculture produce and the price at which you buy that agriculture produce from farmers and sell it to those in town? How would you strike a balance to ensure that farmers get a fair return on their crops and people in town also afford the mini-mill? It is our job to provide those alternative solutions. And when you look at the alternative national budgets that we produce year in and year out, you realize that 
we provide those alternative solutions in a detailed and documented manner. It is one thing to go on a media platform, whether a radio or TV station, and articulate what you do for this country when you become president. And it is another thing to produce a tangible document. Our alternative budget is about 40 pages. It is another thing to produce a 40-page detailed document outlining how you would run the affairs of this country. For us, we've been producing these alternative national budgets for the past 17, seven years, rather. We don't intend to be that long in opposition. 17 is too long. So we've been producing these alternative national budgets for the past seven years. And we'll continue producing them for as long as we are in opposition. Because we take our responsibilities as an opposition political party very, very seriously. And, of course, it gives us great pleasure whenever this moment of the year, this time of the year comes, when we are able to share with fellow citizens what we would do for this country if we were elected into office. It gives us a lot of pleasure. And we are very thankful that you, the media, came to assist us to share what we have for the people of this country, should they be gracious enough to elect us into office to learn the affairs of this republic in 2026. Thank you. Thank you so very much, ladies and gentlemen of the media.